Lesson number six is called Reducing Grace. Reducing Grace. And the point of the lesson is that it's our human tendency to minimize grace and to maximize self-effort. And that is wrong. It's our human tendency to minimize our sin and maximize our own righteousness. And we talked about that in the previous lesson. And all of those uh, attitudes or mentalities are wrong because, you know, we're, we're certainly not saved by maximizing self-effort and minimizing our sin and thinking, well, because I'm righteous and so on, I can be saved. But even after we get saved, even after salvation, God does not want us to be about maximizing self-effort and minimizing God's grace and working in our life. And so we want to continue this lesson this morning. Let's go again to our text verses, Romans chapter 5 and verses 12 through 21. We'll read those. Romans 5 verses 12 through 21. The Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not uh, imputed where there is no law. In other words, there would be no sin to impute or record on somebody's account if there wasn't a law to show us that somebody transgressed the law, broke the law. Imputing is always the idea of something being recorded or put down, right? I'm glad with salvation, the righteousness of Christ is imputed onto our account. And the sins on our account are washed away. That's what justification is about. So there it's talking about, uh, until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Verse 14, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned, after the similitude or the, the similar likeness and so on of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, in other words, the gift that comes by grace, uh, which is by one man Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, Adam's being judged and so on. The whole world is plunged into sin. We're all condemned because of sin. But it says, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. All of us, no matter how great our offenses, no how, how many are our offenses or transgressions or times that we've sinned or broken God's laws, we can be forgiven. We can be justified because of the grace that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Verse 17, for if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. It's referring to Jesus. Verse 19, For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, that's Adam, so by the obedience of one, Jesus Christ, shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned un unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ. Again, I said human nature is to magnify ourselves, magnify all that we've accomplished and all that we've done. A human tendency is to work hard to fix ourselves and fix up our problems and struggles and make ourselves look better and so on. But what we need is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way that salvation comes, is by His grace and mercy to us. And it's the only way for there to be true life change that's transforming, that will make our lives glorifying to Him. If we're all about self-effort, uh, you know, we're, we're going to struggle. But we need to learn to just yield ourselves to God and His mercy and His grace. And just trust that, you know what, He's working on us. He's working on us. And sometimes he's more patient with us than we are. Some of you get frustrated with yourself because, you, you know, I'm failing, I'm failing, I'm failing. I want to overcome this, but I don't. But I'm glad that God is patient with us and he's working on us. You may not always realize it, but Philippians 1 tells us this promise, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, until the day of his coming. He's working on you. He's performing something in you. He's perfecting His work in you. 
And we need to trust His grace in that. Let's pray together and ask God to help you to understand this lesson this morning. Heavenly Father, I'm sure thankful for this Sunday morning, this Lord's Day that we can gather for church. Thank you for waking me up this morning. Thank you for giving me a life to live and help me to live life to the fullest, live life for you. And may you be glorified and pleased uh, with, with how I live and the things I do and say. Teach us the truth of these lessons, Lord, that we may not be overcome with, with the, the, the sense of struggle, but just be overwhelmed by your grace and knowing that you're working on us and that you love us and you accept us. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in me. I'm glad you're not finished with me. I'm glad you're still working on me. I'm not a finished product yet, and none of us is. But just thank you, God, for your grace in my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So lesson six is about reducing grace, our tendency to minimize grace. We'll just review quickly. We said, number one last week, that sin is worse than you think. Our sin is worse than what we tend to think. Sin is worse than you think. Sin is worse than what you think. The negative must become exceedingly negative so that God's positive might be seen as being exceedingly positive. You know, we need to see ourselves for who and what we are as sinners so that God's grace has become even more beautiful to us and more amazing to us when we realize that He reaches down to sinners. He loves us and redeems us and forgives us and changes us. So sin is worse than what you think, number one. Under that letter A, sin is a condition, not merely a behavior. Sin is not just some behavioral problems that we have. Sin is a condition that we have. We have this sin sick condition. We are sinners by nature. Now, yes, we're sinners by choice. We, we choose, choose to sin. We behave wrongly. But sin is a condition. And we all have that sin nature. It's destructive. If sin was merely behavioral, then we would always be trying to manage our behavior and always believing that Jesus is more concerned with our behavior than he is with anything else. Then life with him, even after salvation, would always be about us just trying to manage our behavior or improve our behavior. Our relation with Jesus will always be in our mind based upon our works and what am I doing and, and am I keeping his rules. And God does not want us to live that way. He doesn't want us to be a mentality of am I measuring, measuring up? Am I, am I, am I good enough? Uh, he doesn't want us to live with that mentality, constantly thinking that way. Behavior is not the basis for our relationship. It's not the basis for our relationship uh, with Him. If you make behavior the prime objective of Christianity, it's guaranteed to be a dead end. You'll, you'll end up frustrated and discouraged because you'll never be good enough. You can either be proud of, of thinking, wow, all my effort and all that I do, I'm really something. I'm a good Christian. Or you'll be frustrated with, boy, I'm a lousy Christian. Why even try? Right? And we need to just learn that God's working on us. God is working on us. Letter B was this. Sin is death in us. Sin is death in us. And again, we're reviewing from last week. And uh, Brother Ogpeng gave them a handout, right? Amen. So we've got one of those handouts there if you want to take notes or follow the outline of the lesson this morning. We said, number one, that sin is worse than you think. Under that letter A, sin is a condition, not merely a behavior. And then number, uh, sorry, letter B, sin is death in us. Sin is death in us. Sin is destruction bound up in our spiritual genetic makeup. It's hardwired into our human heart. It is a rapidly reducing spiritual condition at the root level of our spiritual being. We said a couple weeks ago that sin resists God. Sin defies His authority. Sin resents the fact of, of God ruling in our lives. Us wanting to be in charge of our life and so on. Sin will lead us to pursuing our own gods and so on, pursuing our own needs, building our own kingdoms, really making life about, about self. When we dethrone God and we enthrone ourselves. Sin is the opposite of God and all that He is. Sin is an assault on God and His right to be God in our life, to be the Lord in our life. Let us see in our notes was this. Let's give it a hand here. Sin is in me. Let us see you can write, sin is in me. Sin is in me. Sin is what I'm made of before I come to Jesus Christ. 
Sinners are what we are. Sinful is what we completely are before we experience the new birth. Now, do we sin after we are born again? Yes, we do. But sinners are, are who we are, and we're condemned as sinners, and so on. It's a part of me. Sin is a spiritual uh, cancer that's within me. And, and it can't just be treated or managed. It must be destroyed. It must be eradicated. And that can only be done through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us over in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, and you have the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. It's God who quickens us. He makes us alive. He brings us to life. We experience the new birth through the Lord Jesus Christ. But he says you were dead. You were dead in your trespasses and sins before salvation. Verse 4 says, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. For by grace are ye saved. Verse 6, and have raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us uh, through Christ Jesus. It's only when we recognize the true condition of ourselves as sinners that we'll see the exceeding riches of God's goodness and grace in our lives. I said a couple weeks ago that the Christian life is not just an upward journey in us trying to make ourselves better and improve ourselves. It's a downward journey in humbling ourselves and seeing ourselves for who we really are. Except for God's grace. Except for God's goodness and mercy in our life. Let's go on here to number two in our lesson, and this is where we left off. Number two is this. Jesus is better than you think. So number one was that sin is worse than you think, but number two, Jesus is better than you think. Jesus is is better than you think. Now you and I may be worse than what we think. We need to see our sin as being exceedingly sinful and exceedingly awful. But God's love is greater than we think. God's love is amazing. God's love knows no limit. He loves us equally through all of the winning, losing, and trying that we may do. Sometimes we win. Sometimes we lose. Sometimes we just are trying hard to make ourselves what we think we ought to be. But He's loving us patiently. Even when we met, sometimes we be frustrated with ourselves. He loves us patiently. Even if we try to play a game of trying to improve ourselves and so on, and we think, I can, I can do a self-help project and make myself a Christian out of me. In the flesh, we'll never make ourselves what God be. We have to yield to His grace and yield to His working in our life and trust that He's working on us and He's making us what He wants us to be. God loves us unconditionally. I've said it before, God will never love you any more than he loves you today. God will never love you any less than he loves you today. God's love doesn't change. God's love doesn't waver. God's love doesn't go up and down. It's not like, well, if I can just do this, then God will love me more. No. He already loves you as much as he's going to love you. And there's not something you could do today that's going to make him stop loving you. His love never Changes. He loves us unconditionally. He loves us infinitely. He loves us perfectly. He loves us with a love and grace that is absolutely unlimited. God's love has nothing to do with us. He loves us because He is love. 1 John 4 8 tells us that God is love. And He loves us even in spite of us. He loves me in spite of me. Yes, we serve Him. If you're a Christian, yes, we want to serve the Lord. We want to serve God, but it, it's not to try to gain his love or to try to uh, gain his approval. We, we honor him. We, we seek to honor him, yes, but not to, to earn or be deserving of him. We desire to accomplish his will. We desire to glorify God, but not in and of ourselves, not just to try to impress him. We could never deserve him, and we have nothing to offer him but a broken life and a sinful life that he's willing to reach down to us in our brokenness and our sinfulness and make something wonderful out of our lives. And he makes something that's glorifying and pleasing to himself. You could never do anything or behave in any way that would make Jesus love you any more than he already does. And you could never offer him anything that he doesn't already have. 
we, we already have all of his capacity to love. What is God's capacity to love? Well, it's, it's, it's infinite. It's unlimited. God's capacity to love someone is it knows no limit. And God's full capacity of his love is poured out on you. He loves you. And he loved you even when you never knew him, never sought him, never cared about him. He loved you. That's what God's love is, is like. You can never do anything, to behave in a way that would make Jesus love you any more than he already does. This is so important for us to understand that we already have all of his love. It's, it's mine, it's, it's yours, it's, 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 it's upon us, he loves us. Nothing motivates our love for the Lord as much as knowing that he loves us unconditionally. He loves us unconditionally, right? Well, what should motivate us and compel us to love the Lord? Knowing that He loves us with no limits. He loves us unconditionally. You know, if I'm going to worship the Lord like I ought to and serve the Savior, like, like, like I would desire to, I need to constantly think about His love. Notice what 2 Corinthians 5.14 says. For the love of Christ constrains that word constraineth us. I mean, it, it just grabs a hold of us and causes us to want to love my Savior, to want to love my Lord, to want to love God. The love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Now, even our best self works and self efforts are just like filthy rags. It's just all our righteousness are like filthy rags. In my flesh is no, no good thing. Just like cancer can only produce cancer and it, it kills, our own good, goodness is worthless in producing anything righteous. And it is worthless apart from Jesus Christ. We may think, well, I've got a lot of goodness. But yes, I'm a sinner. You, when you start to think that we've got a lot of goodness, there's probably a bunch of pride for it in there, right? So is all that goodness goodness? No, not anymore. If God knew the, 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 the pride of our heart so right? At our best, we're sinners. We're sinners. Isaiah 64, but we are all as an unclean thing. And I said, I'm a holy, perfect, righteous God, right? We're all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses, all, even all our righteous actions, are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Before you think that that takes away any motive that we might have to live holy, before you think that what causes uh, before you think that what causes Christians to live simply or casually is the idea that well because I know that he loves me I can do whatever I want well think again that's not, that's not what I'm saying the opposite is true if we understand just how amazing God's love is it constrains us to serve him if we understand just how unlimited is God's love and how amazing is God's grace, we ought to be compelled to, I want to submit to Him. I want to follow Jesus Christ in my life. I want to yield to the Holy Spirit of God within me. If you think you can motivate yourself to do right, just wait until you start letting grace be your motivator. Grace is not going to be something that motivates us to sin. Grace is not going to be something that motivates us to uh, lasciviousness or to live how we want and so on unless we don't understand grace. God's grace should motivate us to live a life that's holy and separated and set apart unto Christ, consecrated Him, because now I belong to Him. God loves me. God has accepted me. I'm accepted in the love. And now His grace moves me to live for Him. Number two in our notes was this. Jesus is better than you think. Jesus is better than you think. Number three, Grace is bigger than you think. Grace is bigger than you think. Grace, God's unconditional acceptance and love, is the only environment in which true spiritual transformation can unfold and take place in our life. God's grace is the single greatest motivator for a genuine love-based obedience and faith in action. Grace is the perfect environment 
uh, for growth. Grace is the only climate in which God's work can take place, in which the Holy Spirit of God can work in us and, and produce real fruit, spiritual fruit, Holy Spirit fruit, right? Real fruit in, uh, that will be to the glory of God. Anything less than God's grace working through you is just going to be artificial fruit to self-glory. Is it, is it possible to produce spiritual fruit outside the Holy Spirit of God? No, it's not. Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that describes and tells us those things. And so we, we cannot produce the, the fruit that God wants in our lives apart from Him. And if we thought that we were, it would be about our self-glory and so on. In November of 2016, one of the largest trees in the New England states, northeast part of the United States, died. It was a, it was a 109 year old tree, an elm tree, and it was in David Garrett's yard in Vermont. And the core of the tree was was rotted from what they call Dutch elm disease. The tree was dead and diseased and useless and about to be cut down, but. One man by the name of John Monks of Vermont Tree Goods had a purpose for that tree. He ended up, you know, being cut down, but he took it to a shop and he took the wood of the tree to remake it into something new and something beautiful. And he was able to take the wood from that tree and make benches out of it and make cutting boards out of it and make tables out of it and so on. And he took what people thought was seemingly just a, a corrupted wood and he made it up into something brand new. And he made it into something absolutely beautiful. And you know what? It's the same way with us. God comes to us who are absolutely rotten and sinful, and he makes something beautiful out of our lives. Salvation is never about us, uh, an, an expression, English expression, turning over a new leaf, you know, us changing ourselves, us improving ourselves or making ourselves better. Salvation is all about us coming to God, sinful and hopeless, and Him transforming us, Him changing us. We're, we're rotten to the core. I'm rotten to the core outside of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the difference He's made in me. For anything good to come from our existence, we must be reseeded and resprouted and regrown and renourished from a new source altogether. Our rotten, diseased, sinful nature must be done away with and we must be made into something brand new. And it's only God's grace that can accomplish that. And Jesus in us that can accomplish that. And the Holy Spirit of God working in us that can accomplish that. The difference is that when we turn to Christ and we trust Jesus Christ, we're not made into, into some dead items and set on display. We're made into something new, something living. We're grafted into a new vine, a new life source, and we become living testimonies to the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. In John 15 and verse 5, Jesus said this about himself, that I am the vine and ye are the, ye are the branches. We get grafted into the Lord Jesus Christ and he's the vine and we are the branches. Jesus said, he that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, he can do nothing. But in Christ, we can produce the fruit that God wants us to. We said number three in our notes that grace is bigger than you think. Grace is bigger than you think. Under that letter A, write the words mighty grace. Mighty grace. We like to measure greatness. We like to measure progress in others. We maybe measure progress in ourselves. Somehow we see our new selves after salvation as being capable of accomplishing a certain measure of goodness on our own. We, we may launch out on our own independently to achieve and reform ourselves for God, like as if, you know, I owe it to Him. And we take our salvation and we try to leverage it into then our own power. Maybe someone who even understood, okay, I can't be saved on my own. I'm only saved by God's grace. I'm not saved by my works. But sometimes still, sadly, we, after salvation, get the mentality, it's about my works now. And it's not. It, it's about letting God's grace work in us. We maybe on our own may try and try and try and manage a certain level of modifying our behavior. 
But then we can become proud in that and think, look at how I changed me. Look at how I made myself a good Christian. I have a book still on my shelf at home that is called, Am I a Good Christian? I've started to think, I'm not sure if I necessarily like that book. <laughs> you know, in a sense, because it, it lists some things, right? You can look at that book and read that book. I've had some of my teenagers read that book, and they may read that book and go, oh, yeah, I do that, I do that. So I'm a good Christian. You know? We don't want that mentality. Right? And, and Christian, not a good Christian based on your self-effort or what, what you do and so on. Look at me, and I'm better than others and so on. I've changed. It may sound good until we fail again, and we're all going to fail. We're going to fail and fail and fail again. We, we can become either proud or, or, or so depressed and discouraged if we make it all of ourselves, rather than allowing God's grace simply to work in us. What about some of the struggles that you haven't conquered yet? What about some of the struggles you've fought over and over again? What about grace then? Is grace insufficient because there's struggles? Are you really saved then? Is something broken? No. The struggles that we have sometimes repeatedly and God's repeated grace and repeated forgiveness and repeated mercy and patience and so on in our life is what makes grace so amazing. It's what makes grace so massive and huge and mighty. Do you see how self at times could tend to replace grace in our minds? We, we could mask our self-effort with some grace talk, but what we really mean is, do you see what I did? Do you see what I accomplished? I could never have done it without God's grace. But the implication in that is, well, I was close. I was almost there. I, I almost did it. I did most of the work myself to make myself better. It was mostly me. But God's grace sort of pulled me through. It's No, it's never about us. Me, me, me. And a little bit of grace. But we need to understand it's going to be all of grace when anything in our life is changed to be glorified to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not about self-effort. It's about God's grace working in us. Thank God for His grace. You know, the, the idea of self-effort and so on, it may seem to work on the good days, but it, it royally falls apart on the days when we're failing and messing up. In this kind of thinking, my sin isn't really that bad and grace isn't really that great or amazing. Sin is just a, a little hurdle that I've got to climb over. And I can almost do it myself, but maybe God help me a little bit. That's still wrong mentality. We may tend to minimize Jesus and make him out to be a small savior, but Jesus is better than we think and his grace is bigger than we think. We may think, well, my, my faith and his great decision. Now I can tap into God's resources and so on. And he can help me just a little bit. Maybe where I'm, I just can't quite make it up myself or do it myself. He helps me there. No. We need to understand that our sin is bigger than we think. Jesus is greater than we think. His grace is far greater than we think. Sometimes we can be discouraged because we have a wrong mentality in living the Christian life. If we just think, well, Jesus makes up for the little bits that we can't quite do ourselves, then we're not really viewing him as the Savior. He's just an extra little steroid to give us the extra boost to do something we can't do on our own. It's like we minimize Jesus. But Jesus rescued us in our sinfulness. In our hopeless, lost condition, He rescues us. We'd have no hope without Him. We have no hope of success in the Christian life without Him. We need Him. We don't want to live life with a with a, a the, the mentality of a type of grace that isn't really amazing. It's just a little bit to help us where maybe I lack, but no. We need to see God's grace for what it is. We're not to measure ourselves against ourselves. 
but is to allow God to reach down into our life and change us by His grace. The truth is this, that sin is exceedingly destructive. Men and women, we are exceedingly sinful. And Jesus is the only good, great, awesome, and amazing part of anything we believe. Jesus is amazing and His grace is great. The Proverbs 20 says, Most men will proclaim every man his own goodness. That's pretty good. Psalm 145 though says this, Great is the Lord and great to be praised. Who's the great one? It's Him. Who's the great one? It's Jesus. Anything good in our life is because of His grace changing us and making us what He wants us to be. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and His greatness is unsearchable. Put it into perspective. According to God's Word, who am I? I'm God's workmanship. I'm dependent on Him to serve Him. John 15, without Christ I can do nothing. Right? Ephesians 2, we're His workmanship. Ephesians 2 and verse 10 says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works with God of before day, that we should walk in them. When He saves us, He begins to work on us. He begins to chip away at us with all the rough edges. To try to let Christ be formed in us. And make us into something that will be glorifying to Him when we stand before Him one day. John 15, without me, Jesus said, He can do nothing. I'm just a sinful being with no hope. Any goodness that flows is, is not my doing it for Him. Any goodness is God's grace at work in me with God and His Spirit and His presence producing spiritual fruit from His hands for His glory. I meant to do this. I, I did bring it to church a few weeks ago. Then we never made it through the lesson. But you can think about it this way perhaps. So, of me being like a glove to put on the hand and Jesus being the hand. If Jesus was the hand and I'm just the glove that I could put on the hand, the glove is not going to boast about what it does. You go and put on a winter glove and go out and do shoveling. Who's doing the shoveling? The glove or the hand? The hand. You can maybe be some fine painter and put on some special gloves and, you know, fine painter and do some fine art, artwork and so on. Who's doing the painting, the glove or the hand? The hand. Who's doing the work in us? It's the Lord. It's God. It's Jesus Christ. It, it's, it's not us. From beginning to end, salvation and growth in Jesus Christ and transformation and sanctification and service and sacrifice from start to finish, every bit of it, every ounce of it, your journey with Jesus Christ is all about Him. And it's all about His grace and it's all about His working in us and making us what, we, what, what, what He wants us to be. It's all undeserved. Don't be impressed with yourself. Be impressed with Jesus. Be impressed with the fact that He loves you. Be impressed with the fact that He's working on you to try to transform you and make you into His likeness. Let our beginning notes write this. Continuing grace. Continuing grace. Letter A was mighty grace. Letter B is continuing grace. Continuing grace. Sin struggles are going to be with you until the day you die. It's not just saving grace at the moment of salvation and then I never need grace anymore. No, it's going to be a continuing grace that we need for the rest of our lives. Because we're going to continue to have struggles every day of our life. There isn't a, there isn't a coming day when you can stand in your church one day and be able to give a testimony and say, I never struggle with sin anymore. I'm just, I'm just absolutely, I, I got it all together. I am, I'm a Christian that impresses Christ now. You'll never be able to do that. Because for the rest of your life, He's going to be working. He's going to be working. In you. you won't ever wake up in this life and discover that you no longer have to battle against self or lust or greed or arrogance. You have fear in ways you never understood fear. You are anxious right now about things that you haven't cons uh, consciously considered. You're fighting with your flesh in this moment on multiple levels. 
And if you ever think that you've fully and finally overcome any struggles with self or the flesh, then we're, we're lying to ourselves. Even if you've been saved for a long time, the flesh still wants to fight against the Spirit. And your transformation by God's grace is still uh, far from complete. It's not perfected or completed until we get to heaven. Sanctification is really uh, three steps in the sense of when we get saved, we're immediately sanctified and that we're set apart, we become God's children, we're redeemed, no doubt about it. But then there's a work of sanctification, a process of God's growing us for the rest of our life. But we're not perfectly sanctified until one day when we're glorified and we'll be in the presence of God. We'll have a new body that will never struggle with the old flesh again, never struggle with sin again. You may have tried to create a, a good box, a good box and conform yourself into it. You may have tried to modify your behavior so that everyone around you is impressed with how good you are. You may have cleverly covered up some of the bad things and managed to, to mask and hide your weak points. You might have tried to perfect a, a public image that defines you as a Christian by some measurement and so on. But in your heart and in the mirror and in your conscience, you know that there are things about you that are still very broken. You know and I know that we have internal struggles. We, we struggle with our flesh. We struggle with sin. We struggle with pride, we struggle with anger, we struggle with resentment, we struggle with jealousy, we struggle with envy, we struggle with fear, we struggle with anxiety, we struggle with doubts, we struggle maybe with rebellion. We struggle with a lot of things. And different people, different things, and in different, different degrees and so on. But we struggle. And God knows those things about you. But He still loves you. And He accepts you. He smiles upon you with delight. But not because of all the good things you checked off and all the good things you do. He smiles on you with delight because He loves you. He created you. He made you. If you're born again, He has saved you. He has redeemed you. And He knows He's accomplishing His work in your life. Jesus and His finished work on the cross is what made you righteous in God's eyes. Jesus' righteousness has been miraculously wrapped around you like a much an undeserved new wardrobe. God now sees you as being in Him, in Christ Jesus. And that's the only good thing about you or me. As God could see no good in me in and of myself because I'm a sinner. But now He sees me in Christ. I'm accepted in the Beloved. God views me differently because He washed my sins away. And he imputed the righteousness of Christ unto my account. In Romans 3.24 it says, Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is accomplished through all your works and effort. No, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Right? 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 30, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Ephesians 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Paul said that he wrestled with sin every day. The great apostle Paul, he struggled. There was a wrestling match between the spirit and, and the flesh. But he also had confidence that God was working on him, as well as working in other believers to be ministered. We said it earlier, but Philippians 1 and verse 6, being confident in this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you, he will perform it. He's going to perfect it, finish it, complete it. Through the day of Jesus Christ. What Jesus Christ began in you, he's still working on in you. You're not a finished product yet. And may I remind you of something else here. That your children or your teenagers that have made a reasonable and sincere public profession of faith in Jesus Christ, they're not a finished product yet either. Sometimes I've seen parents that get so frustrated at their teenager, the young Christian and so on. They get so frustrated. God, God's not finished with them. So trust that God's working on them to make them like Christ. Understand that Christ is working on them, that Christ is working on you. We, we could hang a, hang a sign around our neck that says, under construction. Because that's what I am. I'm under construction. God's still working on me. He's not finished with me yet. 
If you don't like some things about me, that's fine. I don't like some things about me. I'm not a finished product yet. I'm not a perfect Christian. None of us are. But he's working on us. You're an unfinished, incomplete, awkward, and struggling Christian sometimes. You're not where you were. And you're not where you will be one day. And you're probably definitely not all that you want to be. You're stuck somewhere in between there. You're a newborn spiritual being locked in an old sinful laden flesh, trapped between the law of sin that the Bible says wars in our members and the law of the spirit of life in Jesus Christ. You're under construction. You're being worked on by the gracious spirit of Almighty God for the rest of your life. You're, you're, a, you're a new you, but still in an old container. On the inside, you're a new you. If you've been born again, if you've been saved, you've experienced a new birth, you're a new you, but you, you're still in this wrapping that's kind of got the old sinful flesh nature, right? Welcome to real Christianity. Welcome to a real relationship where Jesus Christ, and He knows you intimately, and He accepts you unconditionally, and He walks with you personally, and He works on you unceasingly. Because of Calvary, Jesus is a good forgiver. Sin struggles are here to stay until you see Jesus. But, but don't give in to it. But do accept it. You know, don't, don't give in to the fact that, oh, okay, I'm going to struggle with sin, so whatever. I'll just sin, 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 doesn't matter. Don't give in to it, but accept the fact that, yeah, I'm going to have some struggles. You're saved to struggle, at least for now, but yes, God can help us with His grace in giving us victory. To think otherwise is to believe a lie no matter how well-meaning or how passionate you are. Anyone that would tell you that you won't ever struggle from here to eternity isn't telling you the truth. We're locked in a struggle, but remember this, you're not condemned in that struggle. We're not condemned. We're condemned no longer. There is no condemnation, as Romans 8, 1 says. There is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. And so if you have been saved, if you have put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you have been born again, and you are a child of God, you are no longer condemned. There is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. We can bring glory to God even through the struggle if we grasp and understand what's really going on. It's a paradox which we will more fully explore in coming lessons. You're saved to struggle, but not struggle alone. Not hopeless, not condemned, not judged, not, not guilted, not shamed. You're saved by grace, and you walk in grace all day, every day. And that unconditional, inexhaustible, immeasurable grace is the only resource that can produce any good. And the only reason you can get back up when you fail. I'm glad that the Bible teaches us that the just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. The just man. If you're saved, you're justified. Remember that. The just man falleth, riseth up again. There's one reasonable response to these truths, and that is to worship him. It's to see how unable we are and insufficient we are and how great our God is. Romans 3, 26 and 27 says this, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness. That he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. No place for boasting or pride or arrogance because it's not about me. It's I can, my, my only boasting can be in the Lord Jesus Christ because he saves me and he's working on me and he is transforming me. Whether sometimes I struggle or not. We tend to think with a, a reductionist perspective, a, a minimized view about our sin and about grace. We tend to make ourselves better, we make Jesus smaller, we make rest, grace less amazing. That's what the flesh does. But spiritual humility is going to do the opposite. Oh, my sin is bad. Jesus is amazing. And His grace is amazing. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll start, stop minimizing our sin and just maximizing our view of just how good and amazing God is. The bottom line is that Jesus justified us 
Not so that we can someday boast of how good we have become. You know, the, 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 the truth is this, the longer we're, set, we're saved, the less good we'll feel about ourselves and the more aware we might become of how utterly sinful we really are and in need of His grace. Ephesians 2 says this, but God who is rich in mercy, rich in mercy, for His great love with He loved us even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. Hath raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness towards us. Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, not out of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, that said a man should boast. Jesus responded to the law of faith and placed our sin on his cross. He quickened us and brought us to life. And through Jesus Christ, we're born again. Since that moment of salvation, he's our life in every way the statement can possibly be interpreted or explained. Sin is a cancer within us, but Jesus is a Savior on a far greater scale. You and I are sinful beings that He chose to love and He chose to save. Before salvation, my clear understanding of sin pushes me to my knees before Jesus, realizing I need mercy. I need mercy. After salvation, a growing awareness of sin should push us downward in humility to recognize Oh, I'm nothing without Christ. I'm nothing without His Holy Spirit changing me. We should be made more aware of His grace and His goodness and worship Him and glorify Him more. Resting in His grace and trusting in His grace that it's not about us modifying our behavior but allowing God's grace to work in us and make us what He wants us to be. My desperate, lost, sinful condition before salvation, it leaves me with only one option, that I need to fall on my face and cry out for mercy and salvation. My desperate condition after salvation leaves me with only one option, to fall on my face and worship Him for His undeserved love and grace in my life. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I ask you please to help us to grasp and understand this truth. That we may not be discouraged with the struggle, but realize that even in the struggle that we'll have, you can be glorified. And so it's not about us, it's, it's, it's you can be glorified through your working in us, your transforming us, your sanctifying us. Help us to realize you are working in us. May we be amazed by your grace and your goodness. May we worship you, we glorify you, and be constrained by your love. But Lord, may we recognize that there's nothing good ever in and of ourselves. And we must yield to you and allow you to accomplish your work in our life. Thank you for what you're doing in us. Help us to believe that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here for our Sunday school hour, our Bible class. And